Welcome to today's webinar on AI-powered precision medicine. My name is Declan McKibben, and I'm the Executive Director of the ADAPT Research Centre responsible for research collaboration with industry. ADAPT is a large-scale SFI-funded research centre. We're headquartered in Trinity College, and we're co-hosted in, in Trinity and in DCU. But we've got more than 400 researchers across eight universities in Ireland. Our research focus is human-centric AI, and in particular, AI for content and media analytics across all modalities, analyzing content, generating content and transforming it, and doing so with control, accountability and inclusion. If you'd like to know more, please check our website, our podcast or our webinar series. Now on to today's proceedings. Artificial intelligence is transforming digital healthcare, and today, we'll explore the intersection of the academic, industry, and clinical perspectives that guide AI-powered precision medicine. In particular, we'll talk about this in the context of Precision ALS. It's a large-scale collaboration between clinical ICT researchers, industry, and patient organizations. Precision ALS will provide an innovative and interactive platform for all clinical research in ALS across Europe, and that will then harness artificial intelligence to analyze large amounts of data. The programme is hosted by the ADAPT Centre and it's led by Professor Orla Hardiman, Professor of Neurology in Trinity College and Consultant Neurologist in Beaumont Hospital. Orla joins us today to discuss this exciting project and we're also joined by Dr Robert Ross, a Senior Lecturer in Te Technological University Dublin. He's an ADAPT funded investigator where he's also the industry lead on the digitally enhanced engagement strand. And finally, we'll hear from Dr Brona Hayden. She's the medical director of Biogen Ireland, and Biogen is a key partner on Precision ALS. Following the presentations from our three speakers, we'll have time for questions, so please add those within the Zoom webinar question feature. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Professor Orla Hardiman. So I'm delighted to be talking this morning about um, this uh, concept uh, which has turned into a reality which is really exciting and really 21st century use of um, technology to try and um, address some of the really important aspects of 21st medicine um, and particularly for um, rare diseases such as motor neuron disease or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and I'm delighted to be here um, this morning to to describe this in a bit more detail so um, the, the um, plan, the, the, the um, um, vision of, for, for this is to uh, provide a data-driven precision medicine-based approach towards new drug development. And um, this is really important because diseases like ALS, which really in the past would have been considered as a single entity, and it's a rare disease, there are only um, um, uh, the, the, the instance is about three per hundred thousand and the prevalence is about seven or eight per hundred thousand. So, so it's a rare disease. So in order for us to understand this disease, we need scale. It's also probably more than one disease. So in order for us to be able to um, find treatments that are effective for the different types of motor neuron disease, we really need scale. And the way we need, the way we develop scale is by working collaboratively um, and by working collaboratively and using modern day technologies um, which are available through my colleagues within the ADAPT Centre. So, so the concept here, the vision is to provide this data-driven approach um, that helps us to identify mechanisms of disease and also then to identify the patients for whom those mechanisms of disease apply and for whom new drug developed, that new drugs that are developed will be most effective. So this is an academic industry collaboration, and it has to be because the two sides of drug development are those of the um, academics like myself who are clinically engaged, who see patients and, and who, who obtain um, very detailed information about patients using many different modalities. And then our partners in industry who are um, um, charged with identifying new treatments and then bring the treatments to the patients. Um, so in order for to, us to do this, we need to be able to collect the data and then undertake very detailed analytics. And this is what um, Rob Ross is involved in and through the ADAPT Centre. And then with uh, colleagues um, uh, from industry as represented by, by Brona Hayden to en enhance the sufficient market access to make sure that the right patient gets the right drug at the right time in affordable dose. So there are three statements there that seem very simple, but that each of those is charged with a large amount of work that needs to be done. 
the motivation behind this is, as I said, is, is to recognize the extant research challenges in translation from new pipeline therapies, from animal models to human disease. And that's a very important point because with the advent of the whole genome project in the 90s and the development of these powerful new tools of genomic modification of animals, we've generated a wealth of new data from animal work. And we have many, many, many animal models that can recapitulate aspects of human disease within the animal um, organism. And there had been a somewhat naive um, belief, I suppose, in the 90s and the, the, the 2000s that this really powerful tool of, of generating um, an animal model and identifying the cell biological processes within that model um, to generate new drugs would, be, would have the capacity in the longer term to translate directly into humans. And of course, that's not the case. And we, we have a, a landscape that's been littered with um, trials that failed, expensive trials that have failed in, in both late phase two or, or phase three, and, and have had to go back and, and really re-explore the reasons for this failure. And so one of the things that I and my colleagues who are, who are at the late translational and clinical side of this research uh, trajectory, one of the things that we've recognized is the need to um, undertake very detailed analytics of the human disease in addition to mirror the analytics that are taking place in the animal modeling. And in order for us to do that, we need to have better tools to collect, collate and, and, and interrogate data that we drive, uh, that, that, that are derived from the human um, uh, expression of the disease. And that requires a, a very um, extensive data-driven approach uh, with collaboration across all the sites like my own that engage in clinical research and then working with the, the, um, the data scientists uh, such as are represented through um, ADAPT. So the objective is to provide these definitive solutions to real-time data collection and that's not trivial, identifying the sites um, that see patients and then working through the mechanism of collecting data in real time, in real time I mean when the patient has the, has the interaction with the clinician, and then finding a way to upload these data in, in a, a um, cost-effective manner. So we've all done these sorts of studies, but they are expensive. Um, we, we have to pay research nurses or research assistants to um, administer questionnaires and then to, to upload those information and then to do the analysis of what part of this is to try and automate that process. There are many, many data governance and GDPR, general data protection regulation issues, privacy issues that we need to address in this new um, environment of, of um, recognizing the importance of data privacy. But we need to enable these uploads from patients and from caregivers. We also need to understand the patient experience for, for too long within the medical profession. Again, this is recognized. I'm not, I'm not unique in saying this. There's, there's a, a, a two-way mirror here understanding the patient experience. We can observe what's happening as clinicians to the person in the context of the, the disease, but what the person is experiencing is the illness. And they're two different things. And what we what we need to do here is to recognize the experience of illness in addition to the manifestation of the disease, because that has massive implications in terms of, of drug development, drug utilization and drug compliance. So we need to ensure a patient centric approach towards these new therapeutics, not only in a clinical trial setting, but in the later um, iteration of the patient um, using the, the, the treatment and to ensure that the treatment is, is appropriate to the needs of the person and that the, the benefits of the treatment um, in terms of the illness experience um, outweigh whatever negative components of the treatment there might be. So the objective is to enable this integration of prospectors who collect it in real time going forward, multiple different forms of data. So not only the clinical encounter that we have in a, in, in a um, a hospital setting, but also um, other types of, of data that we can generate from the consenting person with the condition. So for example, imaging data. We also have a big program looking at the neuroelectric signal analysis. This is looking at 
um, neurophysiological, real-time neurophysiological patterns that uh, represent the manifestation of the disease. We also know that there are genomic components that generate risk. About 50% of the risk for developing ALS and motor neuron disease is conferred by the genomic, genomic construct, and a proportion of people, 10 to 15%, have a single gene that's of significance. Also, um, the, these downstream parts of genomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics, and epigenomics, these are all parts of what we want to collect. And also taking pieces of skin from people and uh, developing um, uh, uh, cellular models of the individual's disease and, and using induced pluripotent stem cells. And then to use all of these data to develop novel ways towards integration, interoperability analytics, so that we can generate these new knowledge to drive translation and research in neurodegeneration using ALS or motor neuron disease as a model. For us to do this, we are partnering with my colleagues in Europe in using the, um, as part of the Treatment Initiative to Cure ALS Consortium or TRICALS. And I'm privileged to be a member of TRICALS and these are on this slide, these are the uh, centers that are involved in TRICALS. Uh, so we have set ourselves a, a series of objectives in the form of a roadmap um, and uh, which, which we believe will lead to a highway towards therapy. And, and the Precision ALS program in collaboration with my colleagues across Europe, who are the principal sites to take care of people with ALS, um, have, have, are working in collaboration with the ADAPT uh, researchers and with colleagues in industry to execute this roadmap using the Precision ALS platform. And here, here is, is what it looks like. So we have the, the um, patient collection and, and everything that we can think of and more about what we would call deep phenotyping of the person, but also understanding the ecosystem within the per within which the person resides, and then using these various different approaches, um, which are are being provided by colleagues within the Adapt Center and supported by colleagues in um, industry to generate this precision medicine approach, which ultimately will allow us to provide the right drug for the right patient at the right time in a meaningful way. And in, in addition to that, to have um, very significant societal benefits because this platform is translatable to many other diseases. We're using ALS as a, in, in one way, as a model disease, obviously a disease in which I'm very, very, to which I'm very committed and, and, and um, the, the, the National Centre for Management Fair, as to which I uh, have the privilege of, of belonging, is very committed to this. But I think, but I think in, in, its, its, in its execution, we will have solved some of the major problems that we have across the world in terms of trying to develop new models for understanding rare diseases. So thank, thank you very much for listening to me. And I'll hand back to the chair. Mm -hmm. Th thanks, Professor Hardiman, and um, uh, and thanks also for pointing out my uh, my error earlier. Of course, um, it, uh, uh, Brian Hayden is with Biogen. Um, so moving on, and uh, and actually just as reflecting on some of the, the the topics that Orla mentioned there, um, the, the, there's a huge raft of ICT re research questions associated with this project as well, uh, not least. Um, the uh, data heterogeneity and interoperability and many other data related issues and our next speaker dr robert ross will discuss some of these issues and in particular some of the challenges related to machine learning and advanced analytics uh, within this project so handing over to uh, robert thank you very much declan i'll just confirm that everybody can hear me and see the slides okay yep, yep. perfect thank you very much so yes um I think Professor Hardiman did a fantastic job there in terms of setting up the motivation and the vision for this overall research program. Um, and very much the, a key message I've taken from early conversations with Professor Hardiman really is about that history where so many trials have been conducted over the last 20 years. And yet there is that challenge in developing good quality therapeutics and that it really does seem to come down to an issue of numbers. And what I want to do today is talk a little bit about that challenge presented by the numbers and how from a, a modeling and a precision AI perspective, we're looking at this precision ALS project, 
both in terms of our overall goals from the more technical side and also in terms of the challenges we already foresee in achieving those goals and a little bit about how we're trying to approach those, uh, mitigating those challenges. So when I say it's about the numbers, all I'm doing here is reflecting Professor Hardiman's point that in many diseases, there are a great many number of patients available and we can we have the luxury if you will of being able to sample from large numbers of patients and hence be able to learn and generalize from those patients and develop appropriate therapeutics and therapies and so forth but however for ALS fortunately it is a disease that doesn't strike that doesn't hit a lot of people um of course when it is it is devastating but it, it is a disease that fortunately any individual clinical group doesn't get to see an awful lot of new patients per year now that while that is wonderful obviously that makes things more challenging from a data perspective what is also wonderful in a way from a data perspective is that we do have access to many different modalities and sources of information in terms of how we can view patients and develop treatments. We have information to class access to information that's classical in the sense of patient health records and information on their outcome and their backgrounds and so forth. But of course, we have access to many different modalities of sensing data, ranging from imaging data, including C CT scans, etc., right through to time series data such as EEG, acoustic information, and so forth. And all of that is on top of the very important genomics data, Professor Hardy and spoke about um, in detail, and of course, information on the various different treatments that have been applied to patients over their times working with clinicians and clinical researchers. So while that vast array of data is exciting in that it does give us many opportunities to identify interesting factors, as a data scientist and as an AI researcher, it does in its own way present us challenges. And this comes specifically in that problem that's faced in many domains of basically an information explosion or, or a, a, a sparsity in data. And what I mean there for anyone who's not aware of the problem is that we have this relatively small number of, independent, of individual patients who are available to us. Yet, for each one of those patients, there is this vast array of data that's available, and each of those leading to interesting individual features. And unfortunately, when it comes to modeling and generalizing over that data, the big challenge that is faced and it is the challenge that arguably led to uh, an inability to extract really valuable results over studies to date is that you basically end up with this very sparse very multi-dimensional data space that we can't generalize over so that's one of the big picture challenges that we do face and i do think it's the fundamental one but there are many other challenges also that need to be considered now how we're trying to approach this within adapt at a high level and within the Precision ALS project is to look at this as something that is multidisciplinary. Neither clinical researchers alone or AI researchers alone can tackle this. It's only through bringing together AI researchers, the clinicians, but also experts in data modeling and data governance, and also experts in process modeling and other experts within our team that I just can't account for on the Venn diagram here, such as signal analysis experts, for example. And it's only through bringing these teams together that we really think we can address that particular vision and motivation and goal that Professor Hardiman has set for us. So in terms of getting into the specifics, what are those individual goals that we want to achieve? Well, broadly, I think we can class them into three sets of goals, just for generalization purposes. So on one hand, we need to be able to extract those interesting features, biomarkers, and novel indicators of disease or particular factors in the patient's history from the low level data. And that is far from a trivial challenge in particular. Why? relating back to what I mentioned before about not having access to data from an awful lot of patients in the great scheme of things. On top of that type of methodology, we also want to be able to support the clinical researchers in hypothesis-driven research. 
And what I mean by that is the basic idea that from a clinical perspective, there may be questions about, well, what is the impact of this particular factor on the overall patient outcomes? And we need to be able to provide services and mechanisms that pull together the individual low level features from different modalities, make them available with patient histories and so forth, and then available for investigation, interrogation, and hypothesis testing in a way that's flexible. And not just flexible to the data we have already, but flexible to the ways in which the data might change over the next couple of years. The third area of fundamental uh, research goals that we have is moving beyond that sort of hypothesis driven level and instead talking about from, from a machine learning perspective, talking about challenges like the segmentation of the data and looking at outlier analysis and so forth, which in the clinical setting translate to issues around cohortization and even micro cohortization, where we know that even for a disease like ALS that has a relatively low number of uh, patients, there, we know that within that cohort of patients, there are subgroups and the different subgroups will react to different treatments in different ways. So fundamentally, we want to be able to help guide the clinical researchers in terms of their investigation of the complete population. So they might be able to build some insights in how that population can be broken up and have different treatments applied to different subgroups. So overall, they would be the three broad classes of goals that we have. But there are challenges and not just the challenge that I've already mentioned, which is in terms of that data sparsity issue where we have a small number of patients and an awful lot of features, we have other challenges. Um, just in terms of the raw mechanics of the data, another very interesting one is the issue of concept drift and the idea that the data we have access to is non-stationary. So what I mean by that is that we're not just collecting data at a single point in time from a single site. Instead, we're collecting data, as Professor Hardiman said, from multiple sites and over a prolonged period of time. We're looking at doing some work with extant data, and we also want to do some work with novel data into the future. And our goal overall has to be to make sure that we can deal with the fact that concepts change over time, sensor types change over time, and overall, even the questions we ask about our data will change. Moving on from that, but staying on the issue of heterogeneity, as mentioned earlier, we're dealing with multiple sites and we want to address the fact that on these individual sites, different sensing modalities, different sensing mechanisms may be used. Different protocols for the collection of data will also be used. And trying to pull all of that information together from multiple sites while addressing all the issues previously mentioned about data privacy and GDPR and so forth um, is a very challenging pro problem for us at a technical level. And especially if we want to make that data then available to multiple different clinical researchers who might have different tools and techniques which they want to apply for the analysis of that data. And this really brings me to what I think is the underpinning most pivotal challenge that we face which is the overall modeling of the data and how we can pull together what is essentially a unified data model that is pulling in sources from different modalities. It's pulling in information that might even be expressed in different natural languages. Bear in mind, we're talking about Europe here where we have so many individual languages that will be used. And of course, we have different patient records being used in different centers um, who may or may not adapt adopt particular techniques or particular approaches to the recording information at different periods over the next few years. So these are a highlight of the, the challenges that we face, but really we think this is a very approachable problem and it's approachable because, as mentioned previously, we're looking at this from an interdisciplinary perspective. 
Um, I'm here giving the view from the data and health sciences, but I am only one of a, a large group of experts that are coming from the ADAPT side who work in machine learning, data modeling, data governance, and health informatics. And we're trying with this project to pull together with Professor Hardiman's colleagues, colleagues in Future Neuro, and indeed the industrial partners, such as from Biogen, over the next few years and apply the best in practice to try to address these very various goals and challenges that I've spoken about. But of course, it is a significant challenge, um, but Professor Hardiman has brought us a very interesting challenge overall, and one that I think we can address. And I hope that over the next few years, we're able to, to work as, as a whole and bring together results and novel insights that are not just beneficial to the ALS project and ALS sufferers in particular, but hopefully insights that we can generalize across into new problems and new domains. So that's it for me, Declan. I'll hand back across to yourself. Great, uh, thanks Robert um, for that. Um, um, it's uh, uh, important, I guess, to, to kind of have that that eye on the prize of the future from a precision medicine in this particular disease area to the potential extensibility to other uh, diseases as well. So that was super. So um, now I would like to hand over to Dr. Brona Hayden. And uh, of course, uh, Brona is the medical director of Biogen Ireland. Brona will provide um, her perspective on the, uh, the industry interests in this particular research program. So over to you, uh, Dr. Hayden. Good morning and thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you to my um, fellow panelists this morning. Um, my name is Brona Hayden. I work with the bio, um, the, the company uh, Biogen, neuroscience company. I'm the head of medical affairs for Biogen in Ireland and very happy to represent Biogen um, on this webinar this morning. So what I would first of all like to do is, um, I'm going to share my slides, and um, then I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Biogen, um, and then expand on why Biogen um, has a, sorry, Olivia. That's okay. Can we can we stop? I, 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 my slides have disappeared. I'm really sorry. Could we stop and just start again? Would that be yeah, okay? Absolutely. So we'll just leave the recording, just keep going. And then you can just start over again whenever you're ready. Okay. I have no idea. I'm just going to start from the beginning. Share screen. Why, why is this? Is this the slide maybe? I'm really sorry now. Sometimes okay, it's... Don't worry. Hmm. Hmm, very strange. Oh. I can see a Zoom box. Oh, here's your slides. Maybe if I start with my slides on, will I just do that? Perfect. Yeah, that's no problem. Okay, so um, apologies. We'll start from, will I give it 10 seconds again and then start? Give it 10 seconds again and then start, yeah. Perfect. Good morning and uh, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to join the webinar this morning. Uh, my name is Brona Hayden. I work with Biogen, a global biotechnology company, and I am the head of medical affairs for the company in Ireland, working in the Irish affiliate, and very happy to represent Biogen uh, on this webinar this morning. So what I would just like to do is um, explain a little bit about the company, about Biogen as a company and, and the work that we do, and then expand uh, and explain why Biogen um, has joined and is partnering with the uh, Precision ALS project. So the company itself was uh, established about 40 years ago, just over 40 years ago, as one of the first neuroscience by technology companies um, with a global reach. So we have about 10,000 employees across the globe and our medicines are in over 100 countries. Um, the history and the heritage of the company is in the area of multiple sclerosis. So we have over four decades of research programs and clinical programs in the area of MS um, and now have six medicines for patients with MS. And 
the uh, globally there are about 2.8 million people diagnosed with MS and of that patient population about 50% have either been or are currently on a biogen treatment so as a company we have a lot of experience in this therapeutic area um, and uh, 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 the landscape itself has changed the MS landscape has changed dramatically in the last 10 or 15 years for now there are over 15, 15 or 16 medicines, I think, for MS patients in Ireland, uh, which is terrific from a patient perspective, for patient choice and for the therapeutic area. But what we do see often for new patients, uh, quite soon after they've been diagnosed, we often see that some patients switch a bit between medicines in order to find the right medicine for them at that particular stage uh, with their MS disease. And, I'll come back to that point a little bit later on. So this is the history and the heritage of the company. But in more recent years, Biogen has expanded its research interests and its clinical program across a range of neurological disorders, um, including neuromuscular diseases, of which ALS is one, and also spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA. We also have a clinical program across a range of neurodegenerative diseases uh, and also ophthalmology. And as a collective group, these neurological disorders, they are the number one cause of disability worldwide and they are the number two cause of deaths worldwide, second only to cardiovascular disease. They're challenging diseases. Some, many of them, not all, but some are rare diseases. Um, some are untreated and some have limited treatment options. So um, neuroscience is complicated, it's complex, and these conditions, these diseases and diagnosis for patients are challenging and really, really difficult. And so over recent years, Biogen as a company and as a leader, leader in neuroscience is partnering and working with different companies, different technologies, and I guess different partners in order to address and solve some of the, um, the challenges that these particular conditions pose. Um, as part of that, new technologies and digital technologies is very much at the core of that and also um, personalized and precision medicine. Um, in fact, the company has had a very, has demonstrated a strong emphasis on um, precision medicine in recent clinical programs, specifically for ALS and also for SMA. But in terms of technology, uh, the company believes that digital transformation um, will enable it to uh, pioneer into a new era of, um, of, of precision medicine. And the, 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 the technology and the uh, ambition that has been discussed earlier this morning by, by previous speakers um, can inform um, a, biotechnology companies and companies like Biogen greatly um, when uh, designing drug treatments for various diseases such as, such as ALS. So the kind of information, the detail on um, disease progression, um, treatment targets, uh, risk mitigation, uh, patient outcomes, um, you know, granular information to support the, the drug development and, and to inform clinical programs. So there are, they, there are enormous um, uh, insights that can be gained from the technology that's been discussed as part of, of this program. The, the plan and the, and, and the vision for Precision ALS is extremely ambitious and the partners um, for this program are all world experts in their various um, areas. The, the TriCALS Consortium, uh, the, the ADAPT Center in Trinity, Professor Hardiman's team, and in Biogen, as, a, as, a, as I've said, a, a pioneer and, 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 and a, a company with expertise in neuroscience, um, together working um, as partners to, to really change the landscape for ALS patients. So it is a very, very ambitious program. It's a, it's, it's a program with, with, with uh, different expertise coming together um, to make a, a, an enormous change and an enormous difference for patients uh, receiving a diagnosis of ALS. 
Um, there are broader applications though. I mentioned MS earlier um, in my presentation. So there's a therapeutic area where we know a lot more. We know a lot more about the, the, the disease. Um, we have many treatment options for patients, but this is also technology that could be applicable to um, patients in MS to take a more uh, personalized approach to their treatment plan upon um, diagnosis. So I think the applications for the, um, the technology are, are, are widespread across um, healthcare, um, starting uh, currently and starting now with this really, really important project for the ALS community. So thank you very much for the opportunity to join this morning and to contribute to the panel. Uh, thanks very much, Brona. Um, that was really interesting to hear the um, the industry perspective there, and uh, and your encouragement and support for the program is really great and valued. Um, <clears throat> it's it's also very encouraging to see that you see the extensibility of uh, of this technology and these techniques and approaches to other disease areas. And um, I wonder, Professor Hardiman or or uh, Dr. Ross, would you agree? With with the uh, the potential for the extensibility of these kinds of techniques to other disease areas, I'll, I'll take that first. Uh, absolutely, it's interesting actually because um, in your pr presentation, Rob, you talked about um, large <clears throat> patient groups and large large data sets. But actually, um, really, it's a case that even for relatively common diseases like diabetes, for example, or even or different types of cancer breast cancer is an example, um, there are also diseases that require a precision medicine approach. And Bromo, Bruno would be very familiar with the concept of the number needed to treat. Um, so when we engage in trials um, in the past, there's this metric that um, is built into the clinical trial design and the subsequent marketing of the drug, which is that you need a certain number of people to treat to get an effect. So effectively, what that means is that for a certain number of people to whom you give a drug, you expect the drug not to work in a proportion of them. And, and, and the big block, even the big block busting drugs, this is the case, there was a, a paper, I think it was in Science a few years ago, giving a table of the big block busting drugs and the number need, needed to treat. And the average was about 20. <laughs> um, now there are some drugs like, which are fairly well developed from a precision med medicine point of view, such as the anti-TNF drugs for rheumatoid arthritis, which have a very good number needed to treat, which is four. In other words, you have to treat four people to get a positive effect in one. So the other three, either the drug doesn't work and you have no side effects, the drug works, but you have horrendous side effects, or the drug doesn't work and you have side effects, or you have the drug works and you have, you have exceptional side effects. So the process that we're trying to do here is to really do as you say, Robert, which is to segregate people into the subgroups where we can maximize the benefit of the drug and minimize the side effects. And one of the places that is leading on this is cancer. But even within cancer, when we, when we were designing this uh, project, we did discuss this with our colleagues in the in the National Cancer Institute over in St. James's Hospital with Maeve Lowry. And even within cancer, there's a need to do this. So, so it's not just about rare diseases with low uh, numbers and high density of data. So that's one, one set of, of challenges. There's also large numbers of, disease, of, of patients where the disease is also very heterogeneous and where we as clinicians treat people sort of kind of blindly in a way where we expect hopefully that the drug will work and maybe it will, uh, but maybe the side effects will be bad or maybe they won't. So what we're trying to do now is to really focus using the technologies that we have and using this sort of platform so that we can be genuinely precise about the right drug and the right patient at the right time at the right dose with the minimum amount of side effects and the maximum efficacy. So absolutely, this is translatable, and this is this is uh, transportable to any disease you could want to think of. Things that it, re, common diseases like diabetes, almost certainly, actually certainly, multiple different causes and multiple different pathogenic mechanisms. Cancer, any any disease you care to think of. Switching for for MS, another example. So um, MS is interesting because the disease changes, the disease trajectory changes. So the physiology. The pathobiology of MS changes as the disease grows. So that's something that this machine 
could identify going forward as well. Well, that's really inspirational and, um, you know, maximizing the benefit and minimizing the side effects, making uh, clinical trials more effective and uh, treatments more effective with the precision medicine approach. It really is inspiring. Um, given, sorry, Robert, did you want to comment? Yeah, no, no, I'll just step in as well on that point, if you don't mind, Declan, um, and maybe just to give a complementary perspective to uh, Professor Hartman's perspective in that if we look at it even from the level of technology and the level of AI, machine learning and data modeling, this particular project, I, I hope, will be extremely translatable to other diseases and other problem types over the next couple of years, and not even at the end of the project, but after, you know, uh, establishing some of the groundwork on the project in that we, we have an opportunity here to essentially build on a greenfield site in terms of how we pull together data from many different sources and look at the actual techniques for the type of cohortization, hypothesis investigation that Professor Hardiman is talking about and look at how we can generalize some of our learnings from that and make them available and applicable into other disease types, other problem domains. And I think that opportunity for translation is huge. And I, I think it's very nice that we're in a position now to look with experts in the field at the best and the worst in practice over the last number of years and to learn from that and really have a, a fresh approach to developing the, the infrastructure and the support of the, the analysis for the clinical researchers in such a way that it can be translated across. And, and just one extra note is that it, Professor Hardiman is of course an expert in motor neuron disease, an ALS. Um, in a way, though, and, and I, I don't wear this as a badge of honor, but it's notable, I wouldn't be an expert in that particular disease, but, but that I think gives us an advantage in some areas where we're bringing together experts in the disease itself, but also experts in the modeling and the, the analysis techniques, and so that we can try to have some level of abstraction from the specifics of this disease that we can then translate into other diseases going forward. Great. Thanks for that, Robert. Um, there was another question in there about really data governance, data privacy. So obviously we're dealing with kind of very sensitive private data. We're doing that in a, in a highly regulated uh, uh, environment in uh, the European Union. So um, could you maybe make a comment either uh, Robert or Orla on you know, particular measures that we're taking to, to make sure that we are good custodians of this sensitive data? I, I can do it from a clinical, but I, I think Rob should talk about it as well. It's interesting because I, I was um, uh, earlier this week, the, there was a the con, um, conference, the annual conference for the, or a, a teaching conference for the European Society of Human Genetics was held, uh, it was hosted in the matter. And um, during one of the sessions, we talked a lot about this, about, about the need to share data and the requirement for um, privacy. And of course, we are dealing here with, with genomic data as well. So genomic data, there's an argument, we said that genomic data can never be fully anonymized. So, so the responsibility and the risk management here is very high. The responsibility towards risk management and the governance around this is very high. And, and the transparency of what we do um, is, 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 is um, essential. Um, and and these, are, these are challenges, I think, that um, pervades uh, the entire um, uh, European um, family uh, in a good way, I think, because if we can demonstrate that we have um, I thought about and, and identified the process by which we can securely um, curate and analyze the data in Europe, um, of course, it, it's different in the United States. Um, I, I think that provides a framework for things like the European Reference Network for rare diseases or, or for any other type of, of um, international uh, consortium programs um, and initiatives supported by the U European Union. So many of these issues aren't really well worked out um, in a sort of a European sense. There's been a lot of discussion. The regulations are different in different countries. Um, so I, I think it's really important. That it is a major challenge, but it's something um, up to which we are. So, Rob, do you want to take over from that? Because actually, you have to do the work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, fortunately, not just me. Uh, and, and that's a, a notable point, because 
as a, a data scientist, of course, I'm essentially a greedy type of creature. I, in an ideal world, I would like to get access to all the data all the time. Um, but of course, um, and for very good reasons, we have legislation, we have regulations in place to that say we, we can't and we shouldn't do that. And for like I say, for very good reasons. So um, we have within our team experts in data modeling, data governance, um, looking at this from the perspective, not just of what are our requirements, um, but also, you know, also from an ethical perspective in terms of what makes sense in terms of how we should or should not share the data across the different sites. So from a technical perspective, we can look at this in many different ways. There is, of course, simply a question of anonymization, whether subject to, you know, uh, people allowing this in the first place, we can take a particular anonymized view on data and pull that together into a central repository that's available for people. We can also tackle this from the perspective of extracting, you know, if we're talking about imaging data, for example, we may take an approach where there's an, uh, the extraction of the most important features from the data, but instead leaving the original data and the, the identifiable data still on site in the original place where it was collected and so we're basically only using extracted or derived information from the original data so there are various ways in which this can be approached it is a topic that has been the subject of many discussions over the first few months of the project and i think it's I, safe to say it's not that we have that issue nailed down yet by any means but it is something that's foremost in our minds because fundamentally it does relate to both that data modeling question that I spoke about, what is the overall data model, but also the issue of infrastructure and where analysis can and can not be performed on the data. A very good question. Though. Okay, so there was just one final uh, comment. Um, so, sorry, there's, there's two comments. One, one is a question actually, and it's for Brona. Uh, we're seeing a very open innovation culture within the pharma industry on this project. Uh, what has driven the industry to this point? Well, you know, I, I can only speak for Biogen uh, on this, but certainly Biogen as a company um, has a long history of collaborating um, uh, with, with, with um, various different um, academic groups um, and, and other partners outside of pharma. Um, and I think, you know, one of the clearest messages that has come across this morning is the complexity Yeah, it, just a short interruption there, uh, Brona. And while you're reconnecting, I might actually you're back now. If you wanted to continue, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. This is very frustrating uh, for for you. Um, so collaboration. I mean, it, it, I think what, what the point that's really clear from this morning is the complexity of the challenge that lies ahead for um, uh, improvements in across healthcare, but also inroads in these really complicated, rare and challenging conditions for patients to improve patient out outcomes. So really, really challenging. And you know that phrase, it takes a village. Well, it does take a village. You know, you know Robert showed one slide with so many, uh, you know, large team of people. We're talking about experts from across the globe involved in, in, in this project to answer some of these questions. So I don't think any one group can, can, can solve any of these issues on their own. And I, and I think, um, you know, collaboration is key. As a company, you know, Biogen has been successful in, with other therapies and in other areas by collaborating and by, you know, bringing its knowledge and, and joining forces. So, you know, I, I, I think with technology and what we're trying to do with medicine, certainly with the digital transformation, um, we're going to bring. We're going to need to bring all the sciences together to 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 collaborate and, and, and to solve these these issues. This is a great example of that, though. It's a great example of partnership, uh, and I think it's definitely the the, the future for, for all of us. Great, thank you for that. And uh, Professor Hardiman. Yes, um, just to reiterate what what Bruno was saying, and also to state that I mean there is a, a sense sometimes, uh, certainly in my profession, of a them and us mentality. So the the pharma people are out there to try and sell us drugs to um, 
make uh, improve their profit share and and where so you know there's a perception that we're complicit sometimes and and um, driven by by motivation towards profit and of course that's not true at all um we are a symbiotic relationship um the uh, pharma companies need uh, um research uh, active clinicians to to um help to solve these problems in the same way as we need the pharma companies to help to develop new drugs the second point is that actually um, Biogen is a very important partner, but not the only partner in this project from a pharma point of view. And, and all of the major companies that are involved in ALS are involved in this. And, and one of the motivations behind this is to develop, as Brona said, a pre-competitive partnership. So this is in the interests of the field. It's not the interests of a, um, a, a profit-driven mentality. It's in the interests of improving our knowledge about the field, which in turn, of course, can be built upon upon which um, new therapies can be built on to the benefit of, of various shareholders. But this is not the motivation for this project. This project is a pre-competitive, collaborative, um, jointly motivated and um, co-created research project. And and my colleagues in industry, ma many of whom were also um, active within within the clinical research domain as well prior to their joining industry are, are very aware and very conscious and very cognizant of the need to do this so so the project is pre-competitive the project is collaborative the projects are co-created and and both we as the clinician scientists and our colleagues in the pharma industry understand and recognize that and and bring this to our colleagues in the data science domain to try and help us to solve these problems well, thank you, Professor Hardiman. That is a, a succinct and comprehensive uh, uh, sum up of the importance of this uh, kind of collaboration and indeed the uh, the potential for and the value of the Precision ALS program. So um, uh, we're 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 kind of up on time now, so we're going to wrap up. I just wanted to thank Professor Orla Hardiman, Dr. Robert Ross, and Dr. Brona Hayden of Biogen for their contributions today and for sharing their perspectives with us. Um, for those who could not join us live today, we will have the catch up version of the recording of this webinar on our website soon. You can also check our website adaptcenter.ie for previous versions of uh, other webinars that we have run and indeed if you want to get in touch with us. So I just wanted to, to, to finally thank uh, Orla, Robert and Brona uh, for their contributions today and also for my colleague Olivia for organising this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Declan. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.